Yeah. There it goes. Okay. And he's going to talk about historical linguistics. Well, not not so much historical linguistics, but the history of linguistics. The totally history. different. Uh, 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 yes, actually, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, we're not going to be doing any reconstruction today, but. Uh, <laughs> M we might allude to it. Um, Even though historical linguistics is fascinating, I oh think. yeah, it's it's the only true linguistics. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, but, uh, I don't agree with that, but it is fascinating. Yeah, well, the hi the history of linguistics is good too. But uh, let's see, when is that going to load? I do actually. Let me see. Oh, I probably don't. That's probably what it is. Okay, that looks like a screen. Great. Oh, I was actually worried. Okay, Chang Gong. Can you read this? Hold on. Are those bad colors? I honestly have no idea. OK, yeah, I, I have no clue. Um, OK, so the presentation, the presentation's title, oh, is that, I can switch it around. Does that work better? I don't know. OK, so um, yeah, so the talk is going to be called Linguistics isn't 60 years old. Um, we knew that. Come on. Well, I, I'll just say there are lots of people. I'm not going to name any names in this department, but there are lots of people who have uttered the phrase, linguistics is only 60 years old. Um, Generative linguistics. Yeah, well, yeah, but a lot of people assume that there no, there's nothing that came before, and this is partially what I want to talk about. I, we all know Samin knows better, but, you know. And lots of people do. I'm not undermining anyone who does, but there's sort of, um, I guess a general, t this is true of like any theoretical paradigm, I guess, because there's a tendency to just sort of assume because we have traveled this particular area, no one's done it before. Um, so anyway, let's just go ahead and get into it. And originally I was going to do a whole tour de force of thousands of years of linguistics. That's not going to work in the time constraints. So I'm going to focus mostly on Paninian grammar in classical India, um, but also talk about some stuff um, since that I think are important. Just really things that I guess people don't touch on that much. Um, actually, let me check one thing real, okay, yeah. Um, all right, so anyway, so the central findings of linguistics, just to start out, so um, language is generative, it's creative, we have infinite use of finite means, that's the, the quote that Chomsky quotes from von Humboldt. Uh, language can be defined by rules, we have you know linguistic rules coming into play, they have an ordering to them, um, you have basically we don't use transformational grammar anymore, but there is some sense in which we have an underlying form or, or a formal form which has operations performed upon it or something like that. And of course, there are distinct subdomains. Everyone knows the syntax, phonology, morphology. All of them have their own properties, but they also have formal similarities, et cetera, et cetera. And another thing that's, I guess, commonly touted as an accomplishment of linguistics is even though descriptively there are a lot of different constructions, so we have things like passives, we have things like relative clauses, um, there's a formal, if you abstract away from those, there's a formal unity to all of them. Uh, so you've probably heard of the, you know, the movement theory of everything, or basically, um, that, that's the idea here. Like what you really have in languages um, is not so much constructions, but um, different uh, like core properties interacting in a way. Um, and we have argument asymmetries, stuff like this, yada, yada. Uh, but we had all of this all before 1 AD. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. In fact, linguistics is really a really great subject because basically it comes into the, the historical timeline basically fully fledged. Um, and so anyway, I, well, the, I guess that I think I've said before, we knew what exocentric compounds were before we knew the world was around. Um, and we had huge explanations and you know, dialogues on them. Um, so anyway, the major works of linguistics, pretty much everyone knows there is this Paninian school of linguistics. It's a name dropped uh, occasionally. Um, so Panini was a Sanskrit grammarian in classical India. Uh, you know, uh, the date is unsure. I think usually 500 BC is, is uh, or somewhere or thereabout is a good date. Uh, and his most popular work and probably most important is the Ashtadhyayi, which is literally means the eight chapters. Um, so this is like the, the grammar par excellence. It is literally the, the most extensive grammar ever written of a language. Can I say something? Yes. Ashta in Persian is hashed, which yeah. is eight. It's acht in German. Right, And exactly. eight in English. Yeah, you'll probably notice that with a lot of the Sanskrit words today, but um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so um, yeah, so it's it's a comprehensive grammar. I mean, you know, th there are other in the modern era we have things like sound patterns of English, which is a, a really extensive treatment of one particular language's prosody or whatever. But the Ashtadhyayi is a full account of all of the 
phonology, all of the morphology, all verbal paradigms of the Sanskrit language. Um, and it also comes with a couple other sort of addenda, uh, all of which are interesting, but we're not so much going to talk about them. Um, you know, he has a list of irregularly inflected words, like thousands of them, I think. Um, and of course, a, a list of verb roots classified by how they're inflected. Uh, and also the Shiva Sutras, which are interesting enough uh, because they're literally just like 18 lines, but it's a classification of uh, basically phonemes based on how they work in the Sanskrit language. It's sort of like a, uh, in, it's re referred to in the grammar, but that's, you know, well, that's another issue. Um, so after Panini, there was a long series of commentators on his work. Uh, two I'm going to mention in here are the Mahabhashya by Patanjali. Uh, we're not actually sure if that's his real name, uh, but al also the uh, Vakya Padilla of uh, Badarhari. Um, anyway, so the guiding principle of, I guess, Panini is what's called Laghava, or economy principles, uh, usually translated. And that gr basically guides the entire description of the language. So, well, I, I think one way of putting it is a lot of people will use the example, so in English we have this sound H and the sound NG, um, and those are in like complementary distribution. They never appear in the same place. And I'll just say Panini is the kind of guy, and well, they're used as an example of just because they're in complementary distribution doesn't mean they're the same phoneme. Um, now Panini is the kind of guy who would treat both of those as the same phoneme just to give you an idea of how he looks at the world and how he classifies things. But the, uh, the, uh, the only driving constraint is simply economy. How can we explain how the Sanskrit language or any other language works with as few principles as possible? Um, now, the entire document, the Ashtadhyayi, is written sutras. Uh, if, if you don't know how sutras work, they're basically supposed to be as small of a, a uh, expression uh, of an idea as possible, very economical. I mean, it's very, it's sort of the opposite of a lot of West, Western works, which are all about prolixity and sounding really big brained. Uh, the sutra is about being very concise. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Um, and the Paninian MO, I guess, or not just this isn't so much Panini, but you know, the people who followed after is first exhaustive, exhaustively describe everything exhaustively describe the entire Sanskrit language, every language, and explain it w only with economy principles, only what formal rules can we use to describe this language with no other assumptions. Only after that do you start making generalizations, you start saying like how can we simplify these rules, how, what kind of tendencies are behind them, uh, and only after that do you make sort of theoretical implications. Um, and that, that's sort of the important, like the, the sort of data drives the theory mindset that uh, people have. I mean, not, not to say that people nowadays are the exact opposite, but uh, you know, sometimes people skip the first step uh, in here. Uh, but, you know. um, so Sanskrit, just in case you don't know, uh, is it's the classical language of India. It's uh, one of the oldest Indo-European languages out there, just so you, if in case you don't know how it looks, its morphology is uh, three, uh, three numbers, singular, dual, plural, eight noun cases, uh, many verb tenses. There are four main classes of verb. Uh, inflection, all of which have subclasses and moods and, you know, all this stuff. You have a fully functioning medio passive. Um, you know, the phonology, of course, I mean, even you, you have to think about the Sanskrit language, like even to be able to describe the Sanskrit language, you have to have a pretty exhaustive, like theoretical view of linguistics. So uh, in the phono phonology, you have a four-way plosive distinction. So that's like pa versus ba versus pa versus ba. Um, stuff like that for all places of articulation, dentals versus retroflex. Uh, you have basically just everything. Um, there's, uh, there's some things that Sanskrit doesn't have, but you know. Uh, oh, and the other important thing about it is in the Sanskrit um, uh, orthography, all, all allophonic rules are written. So in English, you know, we have, we say, when you say would you, you usually say would you with a ja sound. Now, if you were writing that in Sanskrit, you would write that as a ja. Um, in the Sanskrit la language, you have lots of phonological rules, and they're all written, and all the whole Paninian tradition is very aware that they are there. Um, so that's, and in order, if you ever take a class in Sanskrit, basically the first year will be you just learning the basic phonological rules. Uh, because they are so, I mean, for example, one, if you look at the morphology of Sanskrit, one of the most common sounds to end a word with is an S. Um, now it happens that one of the phonological rules in Sanskrit is more or less you can't end a word with an S. 
So S's become ach, they become o, they become all these different things in different situations. And that's in every single word of the language, um, just to give you an idea. Uh, and in terms of, terms of syntax, we have basically free word order, ellipsis all over the place, and you basically pro-drop everything. Um, it dep of course, that the terminology there presupposes theoretical stuff, but uh, anyway, we'll get into that in a second. Okay, so um, the Ostadyayi, again, was a complete rule-based grammar, basically on the whole of a language. Um, again, written in sutras. So the rules are written to be non-redundant. So some people will complain when they're reading like Chomsky that he has too many acronyms or something like that. The Ostadyayi is even worse because it's basically assumed that if you, if we created some theoretical construct five chapters ago, uh, you should now know what that is and we should be able to refer to them all over the place. But because again, the idea is to minimize how much time you're spent explaining the rules. And that consists in basically having the equivalent of acronyms all over the place. Uh, rules are hierarchical. So if rule X applies, maybe it activates rules A, B, and C, uh, and they can check to see if they apply. Uh, and of course, these are rules with respect to phonology, also morphology, and also the translation from semantics to syntax or something like that. Um, now, in some cases, I'll go into the specific specifics of this in a second, um, you have meta rules for how rules can apply, how many rules can apply, what order they can apply in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the interesting, th the thing that's most maddening for me is, uh, we're going to get into spe uh, to the specifics later, but the, the Ashtadhyayi comes to history uh, fully formed, basically. There, it's very clear, in fact, Panini alludes to like a long grammatical tradition before before him, the different scholars he worked off of. Um, but basically, um, the entirety of, well, let's put it this way. So linguistics is not a discipline where all of a sudden we realize that, oh, this new concept, which no one noticed for thousands of years. Um, really, basically, all the core descriptive generalizations, some exceptions, uh, but nearly all of them come to the Sanskrit tradition just at the beginning. We have no idea when people first noticed them. Like, it's not like, uh, you know, someone first noticed gravity at some period, or someone first noticed, you know, this kind of word order. All of them are just sort of there, uh, and we have they where they come from. They've been lost to history, uh, because Panini basically he is writing as if you know exactly what a voiced plosive is, etc. Um, uh, now, anyway, so Sanskrit um, to talk about one case study. So Sanskrit case. Uh, this is what a an inflectional paradigm looks like in Sanskrit. I've uh, you know got rid of the duals to make it simple. Uh, but of course you have singular and plural uh, and you have eight different cases. And these are the eight different cases you have uh, in Proto-Indo-European, nominative, accusative, instrumental, et cetera, et cetera. I assume any of these no one doesn't, uh, someone doesn't know or, you, you don't need to know them, but um, they're, they're just there. And of course it's a fusional language, you know. Um, so let's look at one, one part of Panini's theory in action. That's Karaka. Uh, theory. So ka a karaka can be thought of as sort of a, a, a semantic verbal participant, uh, maybe an argument. It's not necessarily a syntactic thing. I'll, I'll talk more about what it actually is in a second. Um, but it's sort of the rival of what we would think of as case theory. Um, that is, it, it tries to understand why a word's assigned case, what cases they're assigned. And keep in mind, in Panini's original uh, uh, sort of explanation of it, it's entirely descriptive. He's not necessarily looking into uh, you know, what, what conceptual necessity drives them, but just how do they happen, how do we account for them in a, a kind of rule-based grammar. Um, so you have basically these different karaka categories. You have uh, a padana, which is a point of reference. You have a carmen, you have a carter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if, actually, most of the, you'll notice everyone's favorite uh, Persian light verb will uh, be very similar to a lot of these. You know, they're all related to the word for to do or whatever, even the word karaka. Um, but uh, so you have things, now I've actually sort of glossed these in deceptive ways to make them look familiar to you, like undergo or theme. Don't really think of it like that. Um, I'll talk more about Carter in a second. But um, um, so the idea in the pan, uh, Panini and grammar is basically there are rules that, there's a list of rules that check each possible noun in a sentence. So uh, you don't have inflections on these nouns. There's some sense in which um, you, you're presented, when you want to utter a sentence or something like that, you're presented with a, uh, a scheme or, or sort of a, um, not necessarily like, 
It's, well, let's put it, that, well, actually, I think I put it here. No, never mind. Uh, we'll just go with it. So the idea is um, there are different rules and ordered in a particular way. Um, and each word has to be assigned to a particular Karaka category. And each Karaka category basically comes with a case. Um, so all nouns have to end up with case. Um, and at a theoretical la level, all cases have to be applied. But I, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so if a nominal happens to belong to two of these categories, let's say, for example, something could be a, a, sub a, a substrate or a locus and an undergo at the same time, what happens is that the later rule is the one that matters. And I've actually ordered these in the right order. So if something is both a point of reference and an undergoer, it's going to be treated, treated as an undergoer by the grammar. So these are ordered. There's sort of like a, a, a hierarchy to them um, formally. Um, so with respect to Karaka, so, you know, basically each Karaka class assigns a case. So apadana assigns ablative, uh, you get dative, locative, uh, accusative, uh, and the carter, the doer, what does that get? Guesses? Good guess. That's also the wrong answer. Uh, it's instrumental. Um, nominative is actually a, a special case. So we have a division between um, inherent and structural cases. And in some sense, that actually does exist. Now, it, Panini isn't going to consider accusative. He sort of thinks of that as being an, an inherent case. But nominative is a little different. So here, just um, sort of as a background, Sanskrit sentences, uh, here, number one is an active sentence. So it's Devadatta cooks the rice gruel. Nominative, devadatta, rice school is accusative, pretty much what you would expect. Uh, and you also have passive sentences. Um, and in these, uh, in passive sentences, the agent is assigned instrumental. And the uh, rice school is assigned nominative, sort of how you would expect, where the instrumental is the equivalent of the by phrase in English or something like that. Um, now, the other important thing for Sanskrit grammarians is all of the, all the nouns can be omitted. So you can say devadatta, it, you know, well, it's more like by Devadatta is cooked rice gruel. You could omit gr rice gruel and just say is cooked by Devadatta or something like that. Any of these arguments can be freely uh, alighted. Now, the idea of now nominative case, um, now Panini doesn't give an explicit rule for nominative case, but it actually comes out, you get it for free um, if you look at the, the rules more in depth. Um, the idea is the expression of meaning is non-redundant. So you can't have multiple case markings, or may, not just case markings, but marking in, marking, markings in the sentence that mean the same thing generally. Um, now the active verb ending, which is T in the third, or excuse me, that should be can, singular. Can I say something? Sure. This is actually very interesting because in most recent versions of case marking theories, yeah. like Baker, who has looked at many, many different, totally non-European languages, yeah. a nominative case is a totally different animal yeah. that is not marked. It, is, yeah. uh, it doesn't, it, 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 it's just unmarked. Yeah. Uh, also, it goes back to Morantz's uh, hierarchy, of, hierarchy of, of, of cases as right. well. So Panini thought about it. Like yeah, yeah. So the idea in his, the way he puts it is basically the active ending there's some formal sense in that ex that expresses the same kind of agency that the instrumental would. Um, so by the rules of the grammar, the idea is basically you can't have an instrumental and an active ending to express the same thing. So basically, uh, you can't assign instrumental case if you have an active verb. So what happens is the nominative comes in as the elsewhere. Basically, uh, you have uh, a bare, you know, you have gender and number features that exist on the noun, but you can't apply instrumental case because the active ending is basically supposed to be in complementary distribution with it. So nominative comes in as the elsewhere condition, as in this is this was what happens if you can't get case in in Panini's um, interpretation of it. Um, so Panini also has a concept. Uh, now, it, I should say there's not really a concept of a subject and object per se in Indian grammar. That, that entire concept don't really exist. But they do sort of get at the same kind of asymmetries in different ways. So the original definition of the, the card or the doer, literally, um, is sort of similar to our concept of agent, at least how Panini originally defines it. Um, but if you look at the nitty gritty, it's actually understood in a much more wider way. Um, so really, he thinks of Carter as something as, as a discourse. Uh, topic or something like that, in that it's not, uh, you can speak of something, I mean, one of the examples he uses is the pot boils. 
Now, we would say that is you know, some kind of undergo or that's some kind of unaccusative or something like that. Now, in Panini, what matters is we are speaking of that as being a topic. We're speaking of that as being the, the uh, well, the way he puts it is the, uh, where is it? Svatantra Karta, which is like basically the independent or the, you could just say external argument or something like that to make it cruelly similar to modern linguistics. But the idea is basically um, this sort of thematic, this, is, this isn't so much a thematic role in the sense we're familiar with as someone who does a specific action in a verb, but it's more like a discourse role. Um, and this is uh, basically how you get something like nominative case in uh, uh, passive sentences in his idea. So the idea there would be, um, you know, in the pot boils, or well, think of a real passive sentence. So the rice gruel is cooked by Devadatta. Um, so in a sentence like that, basically what you would have, what would happen is uh, the rice gruel takes on the role as, of an undergoer and a carter. Um, uh, and it takes, it would take instrumental case uh, if not, you know, if you had this, uh, uh, if you didn't have the at, the ending or whatever. Um, now, anyway, oh, I, I just as an aside, you could also do formally the same. You could treat uh, accusative case in this situation as a um, sort of as a stru or structural case in the way we treat it, in that you could say basically the passive endings function like the active endings, but with accusative case. So if you have uh, in this, it's sort of Bertio's generalization um, in that you could just have, you could say the passive endings or, you know, the lack of the active endings conditions. It basically says you can't have accusative case. Um, all right, so anyway, one, one of the ideas I alluded to this before is that um, you're not so much translating in Panini and grammar from uh, like some kind of deep structure that has all its lexical items fully formed, and you're not so much transforming from that. Um, but the way Cardono puts it is, you know, the root putch, cook, for example, is said to denote everything including cooking, the internal conscious effort of the agent, putting the pot on the stove, putting the water and grains in it, blowing, heating, etc. Um, and only once all that's done that you say pachati, uh, is cooking of something. So the, the idea here is really there's a, there's a holism behind verbal expression. Um, that is, I might say Billy is cooking stew. But embedded in that sentence is not just Billy and the stew, but really the entire scene, where that's taking place, how he's doing it, stuff like that. And it's just we're eliding those extra arguments. Now, what we're doing, now the contrast between generative grammar and uh, Indian grammar would basically, in gener generative grammar, you have this, these series of transformations that take you from deep structure to surface structure. And what drives that partially is that verbs have lexical demands. You know, I, you know, you got to select your agent, you got to select your theme, something like that. Um, while in the Indian, tr Indian tradition, basically what you have is a holistic perception of a scene, uh, an entire, like you're translating directly from semantics, however the brain perceives that, and you're applying those different rules for case assignment based on the semantics of the scene, not necessarily some kind of deep structure. Um, so the range is actually a bit wider than generative linguistics, and you're starting from something that's a little less linguistic and more mentalistic. Um, and you're taking, you're applying the rules basically to this idea to get a surface representation. But that wouldn't explain uh, exceptional case marking, right? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, because exceptional case marking is assigned to something, it's not. I mean, accusative is assigned to something, it's not. It's okay, well, actually, funny you mentioned that. Um, so I actually omitted the slide. So, well, uh, an addendum to Karaka theory, so in, um, I think it's Barter Hari. He has an account of basically what we would call raising and control and stuff like this. Um, and the idea is um, you don't have something like equidiletion or raising or something like that. The idea is multiple verbs. When you have, like, when a word is, like, if you have a sentence like, uh, uh, I want you to open the door or something like that. Um, in, in the Indian tradition, you would be both uh, treated as the object of want and the subject of open or whatever, and basically the way Barter Hari puts it is if you ever have like two particular verbs referring to the same uh, argument, uh, the one that is what we would call syntactically higher, or the matrix clause, that always takes precedence. So that would be sort of the origin of, well, of ex uh, exceptional case marking. Also with it in mind that they don't, as I said with like the Carter thing, um, we might say in some sentences, so like, um, it's unambiguous raising. So like, um, I want, 
well, actually, sort of, even I want you to open the door. In that situation, I'm not wanting you in the sense I'm wanting you to open the door. Um, so, but in the Paninian tradition, similar to what I said with the Carter thing before, uh, the idea would be, even if you're not like sort of the theme of want, there's a sense in which you're referring to that, like it takes on the, a discourse uh, situation where it is functioning as a, as a Carmen or in their terms. Or so it's object. exceptional in his theory. Well, it's not exceptional. He treats it as just being an object, basically. It, it, like in his idea, it's not, it's not really weird because in the context of language, you're actually just referring to that as an object. In the same way, in a passive sentence, you refer to you know, a theme as a, a subject. That's just how it is. Um, um, so it's not it, like they, they don't really have the exact equivalence of you know, thematic or theta roles the way we have them. Like they have similar things, but they're, they're n it's not a problem you know, for them to have something like an exceptional case marking. Um, okay, so related to this is the centrality of the sentence. Um, and the idea, I, uh, I shouldn't have, every time I put a whole quote, on a, a slide, I'm like, do I really want to read that out like when I actually get there? Um, but the idea here, uh, I'll just summarize it, it, that is sort of uh, alluded to here is like basically the idea of Indian grammarians is um, the sentence as a whole is the unit of meaning. So we think of words as having individual meaning, maybe in formal logic we talk of desk meaning, desk or something like that. Um, but really without the entire sentence, there's not a full interpretation. Um, now this is, now if any of you guys have been to Good old, our good friend TGB uh, has this uh, lecture he gives on Wilhelm Wundt and the rediscovery of the sentence as the unit of processing. And you, you know, if you don't, if you have anything less than the sentence, it's not like, you know, it's more difficult to interpret and stuff like this. But Indian grammarians have to actually have sort of the same idea, and that is the core of communication is actually the sentence as a whole. Um, and if you communicate parts of sentences, those only make sense in the sense that you can recover the rest of the meaning or something like that. Um, so the communication, again, for um, Indian grammarians is not so much like a deep structure, but it is we are communicating an entire scene uh, and trying to make sense of that you know, for someone else, uh, basically. And you can't have half of that scene. Uh, you can communicate half of that and the rest can be inferred, but that is the unit of communication. Um, you have six minutes. Six minutes, oh, geez. Um, okay, great, because that I put like a fail safe in the middle of my presentation so I could quit and I think it's like a couple uh, slides from here. Okay, so um, just a couple comments on ellipsis. So what is it exactly ellipsis? Um, now there are two schools of thought. So of course, again, you're communicating whole scenes with, you know, when Billy is cooking the rice, there's really a locus and an instrument and all these different things. Um, so what happens in basically everywhere is uh, ellipsis. So you're uh, always getting rid of these things which are thought of as being superfluous or something like that. Now there are two main schools of thought for this that are sort of have cognitive theories of it. Um, one is, is the uh, Padahar, uh, I always have to like look at this word, uh, Pada Dihara, um, uh, school of thought, which is literally like word assuming or uh, assumption of missing words. Um, and the idea there is if you hear a sentence that doesn't communicate every uh, karana or something like that, uh, karaka, um, you have to go through uh, assuming the individual words, reconstructing the sentence literally, and then you can interpret it. Um, as opposed to the assumption of missing meaning, the other school of thought, and these are general schools in Indian philosophy, not necessarily just in, uh, in linguistics. Um, but in this idea, the, the idea is basically meaning is, is reconstructed directly from a lighted output. So if I say, if a doctor says to his assistant, scalpel, in the first school of thought, in order to interpret that, the assistant has to say, oh, he is saying, could you give me the scalpel or something like that. Now in the second school of thought, I just hear scalpel in the, the situation I can reconstruct the scene uh, and understand that. Um, now formally, Panini treats the first one as being true or, or at least assumes it in the sense of he says stuff like, you know, uh, oh, where does the second person agreement come from in Sanskrit? It comes from the fact that, uh, you know, there's a second person subject in the sentence, even if you, it's not actually there. He, I forget the exact wording, but it's basically like you can agree with things that aren't even there because he's sort of assuming that uh, you always al alighted there are a whole bunch of different constituents or whatever. Um, now, one important note is there's no syntactic deletion rules in Panini. El ellipsis is not a process, like this isn't something that's happening. We're not d getting rid of things in the deep, deep structure. Um, now, you do have deletion rules in morphology and phonology or whatever, um, but 
a syntactic deletion is either too commonplace in Sanskrit or it's just viewed as something that's not really linguistic per se. So Panini doesn't address it. Oh, went off the edge. That's aspect ratio for you. Um, so um, it's not necessarily addressed by his uh, rules. Um, so now if Panini, the thing I mentioned before is Panini has a totalistic description of the Sanskrit language, but it is only necessary, I mean, it, it's only for economy principles. Um, so if he wrote something today, reviewer two would probably say something like, very descriptive of unclear theoretical importance, and then <laughs> wouldn't even be able to revise it. Um, now, after Panini, as I said, a school of commentators come out. Oh, I think this is the last slide, so uh, we'll rush it all in. Um, so one of the core concepts we think of as being necessary to language is generativity. Um, Patanjali, one of the commentators of, on this, actually goes into this in, in detail in one way or another. another. Uh, Sharma paraphrases it uh, as, uh, uh, you know, how should one approach the instruction about or in understanding of words? Should one take, uh, start by taking individual words and explain them to the, to the totality of language is exhausted? Patanjali does not approve of this uh, technique of pratipatapata, uh, recitation of each word, mostly because it would require several lifetimes uh, with no end in sight. Um, so instead, in order to descri describe language, you don't enumerate morphemes, you don't enumerate words, you don't enumerate sentences, you set forth a, a basically a rule-based grammar uh, to generate those. Um, now, the implications of this are sort of looked into by uh, Patanjali and whatever, but I, I guess we're out of talent time, so uh, that is, oh, into part one, and that's the only part you get now. Um, what is the part two? Part two uh, looks like this. It's the talk about... Language universals? So maybe you should come back. Maybe I should, yeah, this will be part of the uh, Luke Smith goodbye tour or something. i got to do, yeah, anyway, if you want, want to have me back, I'll come back. Okay, but, good. Okay. Thank you very Great. much. All right, thank you. <coughs> Could you send it to me? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I will put it on D2L so you guys can. Great. Well, it looks like we got 45 seconds for questions. Okay. Anyone 45 has seconds for questions. One minute. Anybody? So are you going to talk, I mean, the rest of your uh, stuff, are you going to talk about uh, other schools, like later on? Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. The structuralists? Yeah, well, the structuralists, that's, that's too well trodden. People actually know about those people. So. No, I mean Europeans. I mean, yeah, Europeans. Um, yeah, like you can Martini look at and, and uh, Jacobson. And oh, see, that, that's too modern. I'm, I'm going to go, go medieval. That's the, <laughs> they, well, they, well, I'll just put it this way. So one of the things we should all be aware of this as, as linguists is that there are huge language boundaries. And like, I mean, one of the reasons, realistically, people don't know about the Sanskrit tradition is basically it's all in Sanskrit. Um, or the same thing is true of like medieval, medieval European writings. Like there is so much insane stuff that people wrote about, but people don't really know because like none of it's been translated out of Latin. Um, now I have gone and downloaded all these huge PDFs and like painstakingly read them because I like, know Latin well enough to read them. Uh, and there's so much in there, and I encourage everyone to like, if you know another language that in which there is stuff written, like read it because there's so much that's just not well trodden in the sense that like, uh, yeah, people don't even know it's there, but maybe I'll talk about that next time, so. Very good, um, okay, thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.